Hello, everybody. Welcome to EmberConf 2024. Yeah. It's great to be back in New York City. I was born and raised here, and I always come back here. Don't tell the people in Por Portland that I said this, but it feels like a real city when I come back to New York City. It's on the internet. Mm. Um, so this is the Polaris Tomster, so it's cool. Uh, Melanie gets all the credit for doing the heavy lifting to make that happen, but I'm, I'm really happy with how it turned out, and we've needed a Polaris mascot for a while. Maybe it means we're finally getting close to being done. Um, so we've been working on the, Polar the next edition of Ember for a while. This is, this is actually from the Octane era, but this is my kid Jonas uh, on stage at EmberConf in, I don't know, seven years ago. Uh, time gets weird when you're a parent. Um, and this is him now, so it's really cool. Um, in general, uh, what I really like about the Ember community is that it does often feel like a family, partly probably because we're a beleaguered crew, um, but also because I think we do, and I'll talk about this in a minute, have a lot of values of trying to work together. So there are a lot of other ecosystems that have you know, little groups here and there, but I think the Ember community as a whole really feels like this, is our, this has been our slogan, the most fundamental thing about Ember for me is that we evolve together as a community. And it really does feel that way. Anytime you get around a group of Ember people, it doesn't just feel like people who are you, you're sharing a technology with, it actually does feel like family is maybe hokey, but it does feel like we're really working on something together and like we're all on the same page about what it is that we're working on. And when I say that we climb the mountain together, I mean a few things. I first of all mean that everybody works together with the same tools, whether they're beginners or experienced developers. And every one of these things that I'm about to say, like think about what it could mean elsewhere, right? So there are other places where um, not the beginners and the more experienced developers use different tools, right? Um, there's no special easy mode for beginners. The, the no easy bake ovens is a line I got from DHH back in the Rails days, but there's no special you know, easy bake version where you're not really doing the real thing. Um, in some sense, you're dropped in in the deep end, but in reality, you, it's like a, you're working together with people who are using the same tools. And that means that things like Blueprints, Ember CLI, Upgrade, et cetera, those tools like you could imagine are really just like the easy on-ramp, but actually they're used by everybody, like from the most beginner person to the most experienced person, like I use those tools too. And um, the most experienced uh, developers in the ecosystem use the same tools as everyone else. Um, it also means that we move as an ecosystem together Ember 1.0 was released more than 10 years ago now, and we've made a lot of changes in the interim. So we had ES modules in the 1.x era. Um, we had Glimmer 2 in the 2x era. We did Octane, we did angle bracket components, and now we're doing template tags. So there's been a lot of changes. Um, but when we make major changes to the framework, a huge part of our process is thinking about how we get those new features into existing applications. And in practice, this means, sorry, this means that we design new features so that they can be adop adopted inside of existing patterns and existing applications. I'm gonna talk about what that means in a minute, but I wanna pause on that because that is definitely something that is a unique feature of Ember. Um, basically every other framework, since Ember was created, every other framework that exists at some point has decided to not do this, and Ember has never decided to not do this. Um, so every, and that is why there are applications that are really, really old that are able to use new features today. So I wanna just give a simple example. This is like drilling in a little bit, but I wanna say what I mean. So here's a really simple example. It's from the Octane era. So at the time we were migrating from curly notation on the left to the angle bracket notation on the right. And we made a critical decision to make the, these two syntaxes behave as exactly equivalent. So they're in, the compiler takes the thing on the right side and the thing on the left side and the thing that is actually happening inside, internally is the same thing. We did that on purpose. And so in other words, we chose not to couple angle bracket syntax to the new Glimmer component base class or other changes that we were making at the same time. And what that means is that it allowed and still allows people to migrate directly to the new notation without having to worry about other changes that might be dragged along. So again, this is a very small example, but I think it's representative and in some sense it was like formative for us to figure this out. But the thing is now that we migrated to the angle bracket notation, you can start doing things like using modifiers, which there was no way to do before, or you can use attributes on your existing components. You didn't need to migrate this info box component 
to the, a new base class, you didn't need to adopt tagless components or anything else. Like you might have wanted to do those things, but you didn't need to do those things to start using on or attributes, and that mattered for things like ARIA, et cetera, right? It's just a good feature, right? And that, what that means is that we could start relying as a framework on these new features, on the splat attributes feature or the on feature, much earlier than we would have had we had to get everyone to migrate, because then we would have been waiting for everybody, like a ton of people would have still been using the old thing, and we would have said, oh, no problem, just migrate to angle brackets, and it would have been like, ah, what's that mean? And maybe people still think that that's true today because they didn't realize this point, um, but I, like, I just want to tell you, FYI, this is a reliable transformation. You need to use at syntax, right? But I think it's a reliable transformation and it's on purpose. So I have a bunch of these slides throughout my talk. Uh, these are heterodox opinions that are things that Ember believes that nobody else believes as far as I can tell or it's very rare. <laughs> so this, this point is very important. Um, by designing features with the we move together value in mind, we make it possible for people to adopt the new features much more quickly. That not only means that the community moves together, it also means that people tend to adopt new features more quickly, which means that we get feedback from a wider variety of people earlier. The alternative of trying to rip the Band-Aid off to increase velocity, what, act, what that actually means is that we signed up for years of migration help. Um, people using older versions or older features still show up in our issue tracker or, or somebody's issue tracker, and they still need help. So, Paradoxically, the fastest way to rid ourselves of cruft that we don't like is to design with migration in mind. That way we can get people off of the old thing instead of having a bunch of new people on the new thing, a bunch of old people on the old thing, and you're still supporting both. That's like what happened with Python 3. <laughs> Python 3, by the way, very successful, but doesn't mean it didn't impose pain. It's very painful. Very successful, very painful. Okay, so last year, um, Sarah talked about Heroku's decision to migrate a number of React and Rails apps to Ember. Um, at the time, I didn't work at Heroku yet, but I was so psyched about the plan that I've since joined uh, Heroku, and I'm now architecting the plan to upgrade our existing Ember applications to the latest versions of Ember and also migrate other apps to Ember. And the reason I'm saying this now, I could have said this in the beginning, is that I think one of the most enduring features of the Ember ecosystem is the number of applications that have been using Ember for many years and are still upgrading to latest versions. And in practice, I've said this in a bunch of keynotes, but in practice, this means that applications that have been around since 2015 or even 2013 are able to use aspects of the modern ecosystem that didn't even exist when the app was originally written. That's like Node, ES modules, TypeScript, and tons of other things that have, been, have evolved. If you think about like what somebody would have written an app in in 2013, it's gonna be like Backbone and like System JS or something you probably forgot a little Bower, right? And a lot of the apps that were written then, if they still run, are still using those things, right? Because like, what else are you gonna do? Uh, or they were rewritten. Re re I think like the very nice and unique thing about the Ember ecosystem is that there's a bunch of apps that were written really a long time ago and are still, are now using the modern stuff. It's not that they still exist. It's not like the Dojo story where it just like still exists in maintenance mode, right? It's it, I'm not bashing on Dojo. It seems good that they support maintenance mode. Um, but it, it means that the, these applications are not just like they're still existing and somebody's still supporting Ember. A lot of these applications, including the Heroku ones and, and other ones, Discourse is the one I worked on last, um, are using modern features and can use modern features and are motivated to get them. And that is because we focus so much on the migration story. It's like a paradox and it's partly hard to see because of the, the time scale that is involved, right? It's easy to miss because it happens on very long time scales, but I think if you look at even at any three year period, it's like quite inspirational how, many, how much movement happens in the Ember ecosystem, even when in any given six month period, it seems like nothing is happening. Um, okay, so, like some of you might be thinking that's cool and all, but like I'm stuck on Ember 328, so that story doesn't really mean anything. Um, and that, the truth is, uh, I personally have spent years of my life now helping apps upgrade to Ember 4.0. Um, I've been living this problem for years, so like before Heroku, I spent like 18 months working on getting Discourse upgraded, and now I'm working on Heroku. Believe me, I would rather not be doing that, okay? But I actually do live the 328 problem every day, and I think what is important about Ember is that at the end of the day, the, we definitely didn't get 328 exactly right. I think it's easy, you, it's, it's actually a good thing that you could take the thing I just said and be like, hey, you violated that in 328. We also violated it in 113. I think 328 was less bad than 113 for people who were around back then, okay? But yes, that is true. 328 
didn't really live up to it. But like what that means in our ecosystem is now we're going to fix it. Like now I, we're not just going to abandon all the 328 people. And that's like part of why I am personally working on 328 apps is because it's a huge issue. It's like a lot of people have it. And like what's the best thing for me to do based on what I just said a minute ago is like get the 328 people on 4.0 because otherwise we're going to have a bunch of new features and no, half the ecosystem can't use it, right? So like that is still an important thing. And I think we we owe it to ourselves to keep working on that. So anybody who's like not sure if it's a good thing to work on, like work on it. It's good. Okay, this is an aside. Um, it's related. I didn't have time. I didn't have good slides here, but I want to make a point here, which is another. It's another way in which this migration story is unique to Ember and is different from other ecosystems. And that is that what you write in an Ember application is what I call the authoring format, which basically means like the type, the text you type in your app files, that format is extremely stable. So probably not all the way back to 1.0 because we had weird stuff like bind adder back then, but like back to like 2.0 or mid 2.0, the actual syntax you wrote in your templates is the same syntax you write now and it still works. And uh, the same thing is true about ES modules, right? So the authoring format includes like, imp like originally Ember Global and then import Ember from Ember and then import whatever from whatever. And the, by, when I say the authoring format matters, what I mean is that we treat that thing that you type as having an important stability story that is separate from like whatever Webpack version we shipped or whatever Babel. I think if I had time for slides, probably I would use the Babel example. So in other ecosystems, you would be like, oh, I've use Babel 6, because that's what I put in my package JSON, and that's what I configured. Oh, I want to use Babel 7? Like, it's all on you to figure out how to do it. And whereas the Ember ecosystem said, like, there's a bunch of JavaScript features that come standard in Ember apps. It is a collection of features we are willing to commit to. And when Babel 7 came out, it did take a long time for us to migrate to it. Like, it was earlier in Ember's history. But we were able to migrate to Babel 7, and Ember apps didn't notice it, right? So you, like, the same syntax you wrote before, that it's just JavaScript syntax, right? Worked before, now it works again, and you didn't have to actually do the work to upgrade. And so I think this is just a, an opinion that stability, when you look at things like JavaScript or HTML, actually does care a lot, like way more about the thing you type than the thing that the implementation, like JavaScript used to be very slow, now it's fast, the implementation's totally different. And I think a thing that we talk about and think about in the core team is this point. Like the authoring format is, is is the place where stability lives. It, by the way, I, like Rust also has the same opinion, and that's like why Rust's API is a, is a source format thing and not like an ABI thing. If you're a C++ person, you are aware of all the ABI pain and suffering, right? So like basically saying the source and not the implementation is the place where the stability is, and the tooling is gonna help keep that source fresh, but, we're, but the source itself is the same. It's the same thing you wrote five years ago. Um, you might migrate it. Ah. Nope, separate alarm. Um, that is a, it's a heterodox opinion that nobody else really does. And I think it, it owes a lot to like how we were able to do Glimmer 2 and now like the Polaris template story. Okay. So that's like all philosophy stuff. Um, I will, I admit that I added that stuff like yesterday and this morning um, because, so we had a core team meeting yesterday and I, I cannot incorporate what we said yesterday in this like 12 hours since then. But we actually did do a lot of work to scope down um, what Polaris is so we can try to ship it. And so I wanted to really like emphasize like what, what is behind that? Like what is the philosophy behind how, how we're thinking about that scoping? And basically everything I just said is like, if you wanna try to figure out how to, if you wanna guess like what decisions we're gonna make, almost always it comes down to one of the things I just said. So I think that's why I just wanted to reiterate that so people remember it. Um, Okay, so this is like the original beginning of my talk. Um, so the future of Ember is Polaris. Uh, I think everybody knows that already. And we, get, we do need to get it to a point where people can adopt it and, uh, and it's incrementally adoptable and polished, et cetera. And like we've talked about that a bunch of times and I'm sure more people will talk about it this year. Um, what I wanna do, I should do not disturb my computer. Um, I don't know if you're seeing messages on the other side, but um, okay. So, yeah, so I want to just like focus in on one or two specific things about, about um, Polaris. I'm, I originally was thinking I would just like go through the whole thing, but I've done that a few times and I think I'm more interested in like honing in on template tag a little bit and like why it's good, what the benefits are. It's more than you think. It's like has more benefits than it seems. And I might have time to talk about routing and maybe some speculation. We'll see if I have time for that. 
So one thing I want to say is like the Ember Polaris is like arriving later this year, soon, and now. And like what I mean by this is Ember Polaris is a, is, is a story of incrementally landing. So like template tag you could actually use now. Um, there's some like tooling issues we're still working out, but it's like 95% of the way there. But there are other parts of Polaris that we still need to ship. And so I think I would encourage everybody to think about um, Polaris in terms of like the big features. Like you could use TypeScript now, and a lot of people do. And there's no reason to not use it, right? So like there's nothing blocking. You don't have to wait for Polaris to use TypeScript. And that is nearly true about template tag. So I would encourage you to think about Polaris in terms of those big features and um, think about how ready those big features are and not like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wait for the whole Polaris to land to migrate to it, because that would be very annoying if you're in this room. Like, if you're in this room, it means you're like an enthusiastic early adopter, probably. And I would say, um, start thinking about how to adopt features that we said already and not wait for the whole Polaris to land. Um, so what I want to do this year is like really talk about template tag in more detail and maybe get into some speculative territory, depending on how much time I have about routing. And so I, what I did is I just like went to the Super Rentals um, tutorial, and I, did, I didn't like do an end-to-end, -end, although that would be fun, and some people have done some versions of it, but I wanted to look at specific pieces of it and talk about how template tag fits into it. So here's like the original super rental story, right? So it's like, uh, ha raise your hand if you've like done the super rental tutorial at some point. It's like enough people that I could rely on it, I think. Um, so basically, this is the point of the tutorial where it's like, oh, look, we have used the same content in multiple places. It would sure be great if we could move it to a different place. So like, then we moved it into this handlebars file. And that's like the thing the Super Rentals tutorial is teaching you. Um, and then like, what you did back then is, you, um, is that you migrated the, like, the parts that are shared into a separate component, right? And yeah, and that's the middle part. Right now, the thing I want to say is like that same example, that same example works with content tag. And the way it works is basically the exact same thing. Um, it's basically the exact same thing, except now you import Jumbo. Um, I'm using hash app here. I talked to Ed about this yesterday about like, are we actually going to do this? I think we are actually going to do it, but I think there's still some small things to work out. But basically, there's an NPM feature now that lets you say like, here is an alias in my package JSON that points at some part of my app. So instead of having to like use the, your full app name, which you could totally use, but then if you refactor, it's like really annoying, or um, having to use like TypeScript path mappings or some tooling shenanigans, like this is basically the official way to do it. And I think as like Ember now wants to use the official way of doing it, so like I'm using it in my examples here, but I think we'll actually do it. So Basically, on the left side, you can see it's like basically the same story. We like now have template tag, but the most basic refactoring that along the lines of what we just said, and these are examples where there's no there's no state, right? The most basic refactoring is just to like add a template tag, and now you import things, and that like unlocks all of the ecosystem functionality, like your like the better tooling, like static analysis, whatever, like all the things that people ever say they want Ember to be able to do, like really gets unlocked by just importing your components and um, using template syntax. Um, one thing I want to point out, and I think this is like not obvious to everybody, is that, and I think Ed told me this works already, is that the right-hand side is, like, is, is just another use of template tag, right? So this is something where like a single file component solution can't actually do this. A single file component solution, like you can't make, you have to, each test would have to be its own file, right? So this is a, a situation where we still get to use template syntax, but we get to use it in multiple places. And if you're not sold on the, um, on the helper component story, which is like one reason to care, I think testing is a really compelling reason to care. And it's a way of getting us away from like yet another bespoke thing that we used to do. Um, that said, I think helper components is also a compelling reason to care about this. So here's another example in super rentals where we basically said, OK, like now we're going to make a rental image. And I think the tutorial does it just to like show you that you can make a component, right? But it's like, by the way, you can make the rental image, and then by the way, dot, dot, dot attributes work, so you could pass SRC and alt, right? So it's like teaching some stuff in the original tutorial. And I think the point I want to make is like, this is another really useful thing. Like, you have the template tag syntax, but you can just easily extract pieces of it out and make your own local components. This is an example where you're just using template tag as is, but you could also put, like, make a, another class that you refer to. Like, basically all the features work. And I think, so the, I'm basically trying to show you that there are some 
Um, like, why do we care about this? And it's not just like, oh, now you have to write import all the time. There's like some benefits that you get out of it. Okay. And then I just also want to point out, if you're like, I don't want to have everything in my same file, like it's actually, even if you think that, it's actually nice to like start in the same file. Like I've done this a ton of times with template tag. It's like, I'm going to extract this, but this, I like right now, I just want to stay in the flow that I'm in right now. So I'll like put it in the same file for now. And it's like, it just works. And then because it's just like a JavaScript identifier, if I move it into another file and import it, like everything keeps working. So that's like a really nice thing. And I think the super rental tutorial probably would either tell you the thing I just said or just do the extraction in the first place. And then it's the same thing, right? But it's like, these are all just like, now a lot of different concepts are like coalesced into mostly JavaScript imports and this content tag feature. Um, if you added state, so this is another thing super rentals did. So if you added state, um, so now we have track properties, we have a separate HPS file. This I think you've probably seen already, but like this is basically, it's the way, the combination of the two files is one file and it works, right? So basically what it means is like the this syntax inside the template refers to the class and then all the things that you already learned work. The reason I wanna emphasize this is that I think what's good, just like what I said earlier about like the curly syntax still w works with angle brackets, I think very little other than the place where you put the template and the fact you're importing it changed. So like, sure, maybe it would be nice if we use JavaScript expression syntax someday, and, but even if we did that, like this syntax would still work, right? So basically this is just a coalescing um, right now behind the scenes, like something like this is already happening in the in Embroider. Um, and basically this is just what the thing on the left means in reality, but now you can write it. Now here's a heterodox opinion. And I'm actually sad that the, like heterodox opinion in this talk means like nobody else believes this. I'm actually really pretty sad that this is true. Um, but what I mean when I say like classes are good actually is not like, oh, I'm a, oh, per I, like I actually don't care about that. What I mean is that every single framework, it has a setup part of the component and a render and re-render part of the component. And some frameworks like hide it inside of something like script setup or something like that. And some frameworks have a system where like the same function is run multiple times and you could sort of like color the parts that are running in each phase. But at the end of the day, like, I'm gonna get myself, like what is use state other than a field, right, in, at the end of the day? And so it, if what you're trying to express is I have a bunch of state, like it's one thing if you're like, oh, it's a pure function, fine, right? But if what you're actually trying to express, I have a bunch of state and I would like to com like use it in a mutable way with my other code, like we just have a feature for that. It's called, it's classes. And there's no actual reason why we have to keep inventing like other syntaxes for classes. And it doesn't actually help any, like the tooling is actually not helped. Like, yes, other ecosystems have more people and they could do all the heavy lifting to like invent a whole bunch of new tooling for just like for their script setup solution. But we just, constructors already exist and we don't have to invent tooling for constructors if we just use them, right? So, and, or we use class fields. So I think there's a lot of things that like could suck about classes. I think people over inherit, mixins were bad, et cetera. But just like having a place where you put your state, if, especially if it's mutable and there's some way of interacting with it in a structured way in a normal JavaScript way that like TypeScript understands, like that's, that's just good. I think, I really wish more people believe this. Um, I, by the way, another aspect of this is like services are classes on purpose. Um, in other ecosystems, you just like use module state and then like five minutes later, you have like introduced a feature to your testing framework called like mock module or something. It's like, no, it's just like you wanted to make an instance of this thing. So like, why don't we just make an instance of this thing? Oh, and if you need to clean it up, like, ah, you had an instance, so when the instance goes away, you can clean it up, versus like, oh, I guess you have to figure out how to do some extra new thing when the whole app goes away, like some special custom feature. So basically, I just think like, if what you have is instances with some known lifetime with some mutable state on it, like we just have that feature, we should just use it. Okay, um, testing. So I talked about this already. Um, so this is, this is the thing I talked about already, which is like, you could just use template tag here. I think that's already good. But I think there's another point I would make here, which is that here's what you did before, which is like this.set properties. And that is like what's really happening behind the scenes there is that there's like a special magical context, which is not a regular component, which is where your state lives. And behind the scenes, the template, the test system is making that, that this context available inside of render in a way that it's like not how anything else works in Ember. I'm not saying there's anything like horrible about it, but it just like doesn't match the normal way you're doing things. And I think the React testing library philosophy, which is basically like your, the way you test should feel like how you write your code is correct. And I think this is a 
a, a glitch in that. Like you're, the way you're writing your test is not that close to how you're writing your code. Um, but like you in here is like if you don't have a mutable state, like this this is actually a good thing. Like you can basically just go make a const. The const is in scope. It's allowed, and now you can use it. And now you don't actually need that other feature. Are we going to remove that feature? No. It's like it would be a breaking change, etc. We're not going to do that. But you actually don't need it, right? You you can stop using this stop because you can just put your um, you can just use a, a const. I also want to point out. I don't think I have a slide for this, but um, you also could use like a tracked object as the and then like just like pat like you can mutate the tracked object. You don't actually need this dot. You can just like say const equals tracked object. You could pass that into your component and then you can mutate it from the outside. So basically there's like now that the template tag has the feature of things that are in lexical scope are in scope. Like now that that exists, you like there, it's just pretty easy to adapt a bunch of existing patterns. Um, here's a heterodox opinion that uh, is about testing is not um, totally on point, but it, like I was reminded of it as I was writing those examples. Again, this is like weirdly a thing that Ember is like uniquely cares about, and it's like actually the reason we still use QUnit, um, which it's it, not that we have to use QUnit for it, but like it's it's the place where the people care about this constraint. Basically, I, I don't know like I don't know about I don't know about you, but when something is going wrong in my test, I want to just like use the browser's dev tools to look at what's going on. Like there's a reason we have pause test and the dev mode. Like those features exist because if something goes wrong, you just like want to look at it as if it was your app and like see what's up. And like the second you go into another ecosystem, it's like oh my god, like I'm I, I'm back to like printf debugging, which is like it's one of these things like like uh, go to considered harmful, where like everybody already knows like printf debugging is bad, and yet it is like the only way to do debugging and tests in any other ecosystem. And that's just like again, it also blows my mind that people haven't like made. Oh, you just like use the Node Inspector and the Chrome Dev Tools like ergonomic enough that everyone does it. Like for whatever reason, that's just not how it works. So what ends up happening is that like you just are back to printf debugging, and then it's like okay, I just wasted like 10x the amount of time I could have just like or 100. I could have just put a debugger and looked at it, and I do that like all the time. Okay, so what I want to say about template tag, and this is like I think I won't have enough time to talk about routing in depth, but what I want to say about template tag is that. This is like the real takeaway. There's a unique thing going on in the Ember ecosystem that is not similar to what everyone else is doing here, which is that we still have templates. So we have a template feature. It uses normal HTML. It's not JSX. It's not a weird expression that runs a bunch of times. It's a regular template. Go watch other people's talks to find out why it's good. Like React is really the only system that doesn't use templates. Like everyone uses templates, Svelte, Vue, et cetera. Um, but those templates are embeddable inside of a file, right? So you don't need like a separate file that represents the entire thing, which you basically end up needing in there because they're trying to like invent a class, right? So it's like, oh, I, I need a class syntax, but I'm not using classes. So now I need to like have a script tag that represents the constructor and a whatever. And like that, you, it's not easy to resolve that. Um, but Ember does this. And I think like one of the reasons I keep working on Ember is like these heterodox opinions. And I think this particular one, I'm like hoping other people try to adopt because I think there's something nice about both having like templates for all the things that are good about it and having them be embeddable. Um, if you're familiar with Solid, it's like this story is basically solid but with actual templates and not like trying to hack the JSX mindset, which I think is like a fool's errand. I think trying to convince people like, oh, that thing you learned in React, here's a bunch of different ways to think about that same syntax is like, I, also HTML is good. So I don't have time to talk about routing. I'm gonna like, I wanna say this slide, and then I'm going to like skip to the end. So what I want to say here is like, if you go back to the beginning of Ember and you look at our first ever talks, like one of the things that was formative for us is that we realized that like Ember is fundamentally a web framework. And what it means that it's a web framework is that URLs are front and center. The way you go to a uh, place on your, in your web app is by using a URL. And Ember applications have had working URLs out of the box. That doesn't mean other ecosystems don't have routers. It just means that every single Ember app has a router and there's a URL, even if it's just slash. Like that, that is the way you get to your app. What this means in practice is that a whole bunch of features that are like pretty normal and you expect like refreshing the page or opening in a new tab or using the new like Chrome and Edge now have like duplicate this tab or just like taking the URL and sending it on like messages or Telegram or something. Um, and like any other way that you use a URL, like putting it on a billboard, like all that works as expected. And I'm not going to say that yet. And I think the, the point that I want to make here is that you have to actually decide to care about this. It's not just like we have a router. It's also that the way you are expected to interact with the state that is 
in your actual components is by putting it in the router if it is important enough to survive refreshing and reloading, well, like those things, right? And I think what is good to think about is that people don't think about this in the Ember. It's not like you're spending all your time, oh, I wonder what state I need to put in the URL. Just like in practice, for the most part, you're just like doing the normal thing. You're making a new page. It's ergonomic enough to make nested pages. And when you reload the page, it like generally works, right? And I think that like what the reason I want to say this is that this is still a fundamental like front and center thing about the Ember router. And whatever we end up doing in the future, which is still like in speculative territory, this is like going to have to be true because this is like fundamental to what makes Ember a web framework and what makes the Ember routing system good. And, and I like I, I don't like comparing and contrasting with other frameworks that much, but there are a lot of routers in the world that don't do this correctly. I think one example that I will give that is a little pointed is a lot of people like file system based routing, right? But what is the point of file system based routing? It's like, oh, I just like put my files wherever I want and then the routing just worked. It's like transparent. Oh, I want to rename a directory. Oh, it's so easy. I could just rename the directory. Okay, the problem is now that the URLs that worked yesterday don't work anymore. And there's, it's not like, I don't mind breaking URLs. It's not like, it's not like I'm not a doctrinaire about that. But that structure doesn't like make you notice that you did anything that's a breaking change for your URLs. So like, I think if I was going to do file system routing, I would have the generator like put the initial URL in there. And then like, if you renamed it, you would keep whatever URL you started with. A path is the one you would still have. And then you would have to change it, something like that. But that's like a thing that you could think about if you're trying to think about URL stability as like an important requirement. And if you're just building a router because it's like you believe in state machines or something, you could just like totally miss that. And I think, and that's like what a lot of people are doing. Um, so here is just, this is not like, don't take this too seriously because now we're in speculative territory and I'm going to skip the rest of it. But this is like, the point is basically if you keep following like what it means that we're, uh, that we have template tag and we have imports, there's a lot of places where it starts also being useful. So we already talked about testing. Um, but routing is another place. And there's just a lot of details around how to make the loading story around, around routing work correctly so that you don't get waterfalls and whatever. You have a loading spinner when you need the loading spinner, et cetera. But I think some version of this where basically you're, you, we're not relying on having a, like a global resolver thing that knows about where your, how your file system is structured, but rather that there's like a lo more loosely coupled story that has to do with imports and modules, I think is some version of that will happen at some point, and I just want to point that out. I wanted to say the left part first, because if you notice that the thing we're doing on the right side, the speculative part, doesn't comply, you should like say that, because that's a huge bug. Like That would be a bug. Okay, I'm just, like, just going to skip the whole section that starts here, which is like we have some speculative stuff going on. I'm basically just reiterating. I think this is worth pointing out. Like, I think some version of this would probably happen, which is like instead of this is like leaning on the fact that you could import the router. But I think the more important po point is I think everybody is ready for href, a href to be the way things work. And I think that is definitely on the docket. Um, OK. Yeah, I think this is like the main point I want to make here. Like, I think we're going to move to using a href and like having things like active be a thing you import, et cetera. Um, this is extremely speculative. So like, whatever. Um, I'm going to also skip all this. So I basically reiterate, like I got into more detail. All of this is from like before I added the philosophical part in the beginning and I was like, maybe I'll have time. I do not. Um, yeah, data stuff. I will just make this point because it's like, I, I think basically people think that like you either have a client side routing or you have server side rendering. And it's like server side rendering is very annoying, so people don't really do it that much. It's like requires you to deal with all these problems to do a server side rendering. And then people are like, oh, I can either like deploy to a server that like a, a platform that like does a bunch of magic for me or like give up on it. I think there's a middle ground. It is probably what I'm like, I don't want to speak for Ember Data, but I think it's like philosophically aligned, which is basically to say, like, what if we separate the data loading part from the rendering part, which we already do, like that's what the model hook is, and we're gonna keep refining that. Like if we already do that. The, the aspect of the thing where you're just like get, fetching the data is that does not have a lot of complexity to it. Right? That part is easy, Com like in comparison to like all the details. Yes, I'm almost done. Um, I, my next slide is my last slide. Um, and I think there's just a space in the middle where it's like, okay, we are not actually going to, like we're going to keep working on SSR, people want it, et cetera, but that like the, we're going to like really push on making data loading, a thing that works really well out of the box, because that part does not introduce all the complexity that makes every single other system that tries to make SSR work, including our system, like crash on the rocks. And I think 
there is a lot of upside, low-hanging fruit to just like trying to get the data loading part. It does require that you separate data loading from rendering, but we already do that and we will keep doing that. So I think, I think that's what's up. Um, here's the list of them. I'll just say them out loud and then I'm done. So it's like when you design new features with migration in mind, you move faster, not slower. A stabling authoring format is an important goal. Um, classes are good, actually. Running tests in a browser. I don't know what a one default is. Running tests in a real browser is the highest possible testing priority, and server-side data loading is a good default is what I wanted to say there. And again, I think like the framing here is just like everybody, like these are all things that for better or worse, like Ember is the only one that believes in it. And it's like more or less the reason I still work on Ember. It's like if Ember stopped existing, like every single thing on this list would stop being a thing in the world, right? I think, and I think that would be a real shame. So um, that's why it's still good that Ember exists. And I think that's why it's like really important for us to make, to keep iterating so that Ember keeps being competitive or like becomes more competitive, because I think these things are good. They will shine more when Ember is more competitive, but these things are actually good. And if you're an Ember user, you already know that. So I think um, we, should, we should keep doing that. Thank you.